Welcome to Film at 50, a podcast that celebrates semi-centennials in the world of cinema. I'm your host, Brian Rowe. Very excited to welcome Dylan Gonzalez to the podcast today to talk about Slaughterhouse Five, released 50 years ago. How are we doing, Dylan? I'm doing well, Brian. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to talk about this with you. Thanks so much for being here to talk about this movie. I had not heard of this film before a few weeks ago, kind of researching potential titles for the podcast. Of course, I was familiar with the novel by Kurt Vonnegut. Like, had you, did you know that this was a movie too? Yes, whenever you reached out to me, I was excited because I've had, I've had this uh, Blu-ray from Arrow Video on my Amazon wish list forever. And it just gave me the perfect opportunity to finally pull the trigger. I needed a, a justification of just, why do I need to buy this right now? And I'm like, I'm on a podcast, it has to be done. Uh, so I ordered that, got it in, watched it, all the special features, watched it with commentary. So oh, I'm as cool. prepared that I can, as I can be it, with this movie in particular. <laughs> so what were the bonus features? Like who was on the commentary? Um, there was like a, a film historian who was uh, like viewing it from like a okay. modern. So it was kind of like, not anyone involved with the actual movie. Okay, it wasn't Hill, it wasn't the director. No, uh, unfortunately, he they the special features were produced at a time like way after his death, unfortunately. Okay. Um, but there were some good uh, uh, interviews with the uh, like a, like an assistant producer and like the son of the screenwriter mm-hmm. and the producer. So there were a lot of really good uh, interviews. Um, there was like a visual essay from like a noted film historian who was like analyzing it compared to the book and every and stuff like mm. that. So there were a, it was pretty packed release. And if, if people do like this movie, I would recommend it because it has like a really nice like 2K transfer. So oh, it looks cool. really nice and everything. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm a home media guy, so. <laughs> No, same here. I am so big on if, if, especially if you really love a film, like own a copy of it at home. Because if you're just relying on it to be streaming somewhere, it's not necessarily going to be the case. I mean, I remember recently I wanted to watch something. I can't remember what it was. And it was, I, I like I found it on HBO Max or Netflix or something. And then three weeks later, when I went to watch it, it was gone. <laughs> it's like, that's why we, we have to own these films, you know? Absolutely. If you saw my collection here, you would understand how much I agree with that sentiment. I'm <laughs> yes. insane. <laughs> that's fantastic collection. Have you been collecting uh, DVDs ever since like DVDs and Blu-ray since you were younger? Like when did you start collecting? Uh, pretty much like that's kind of the gateway into my love of film Mm -hmm. like I think everyone who comes on here would probably be like yes I liked movies from a young (laughs) age like yes we're all on film twitter we've all liked movies forever (laughs) (laughs) I I think what really opened up the world for me in particular was when I got that first like DVD and just exploring all of like the special features and listening to the commentaries and like Mm. learning more about the process of film and learning all the fun little aspects that go into a production. It really helped me understand what, like, why film is so special. Mm So I just kept owning, like purchasing and purchasing because I live uh, in Tennessee, like in a little town, a little bit outside of Nashville. Okay. So there wasn't like a ton of opportunities to see like a lot of independent or smaller films um and my parents weren't the type to like go to the independent theater deep into nashville like i, I wasn't going to be like a 10 year old asking to go to like see some like <laughs> french film down in nashville uh, but having those movies available to me on disc like mm. like i would discover movies like like I got into Kevin Smith and I like saw mm. Chase Amy was on like the Criterion, uh, like the Criterion collection mm-hmm. or like, Monty Python had like Life of Brian there. And I was like, what is the Criterion collection? And <laughs> I, I like kept exploring and that's kind of what opened up me to like world cinema mm. and like independent cinema. And 
it just gave me access to all of these movies that I just otherwise wouldn't have known about. So it's just kind of like physical media is what introduced me because there wasn't like Netflix and right. all this stuff. I was just in the early aughts and like late nineties, just trying to figure out how to like, if my local movie gallery didn't have it, I, it wasn't a thing. So yeah. I, it was just a really cool way to, for me to personally get into film. Yeah, streaming films is fairly new. I mean, I want to say even 10 years ago, there was, weren't many. That's really like with the last five to seven years. And before that, if you didn't own the movie, you would just have to go on, you know, turn on the TV and hope that it, you know, it was playing or something. So it's kind of a late thing to be like, oh, I'll just wait till it's on streaming. That wasn't something we were doing even 10 years ago. Absolutely not. I remember whenever Netflix introduced their streaming option, I was like, that seems suspect. I, I, <laughs> little did I know. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah, DVD, I remember, I, I'm old enough to remember like walking into the video store for the first time and they had a tiny little rack of like eight DVDs. This was like maybe late 97. And I was like, oh my God, it has a director's commentary. <laughs> like nerdy 12 year old me was just like, oh my God, this just opened up a world of possibilities. And to this day, I adore bonus features. I mean, I, I feel like they were making more bonus features like 10, 15 years ago than they do now. Unless you go to a Criterion Collection or Scream Factory or one of these guys who just, they do always do a fantastic job. I feel like newer movies now, like sometimes you won't necessarily find on the Blu-ray, like a really good director's commentary. It's kind of few and far between. Yeah, a lot of like mainstream movies, they'll put like four, like three to four minute featurettes. Of just, like, <laughs> yeah. being like, I really enjoyed working with my co-stars and director. I'm like, well, I, I understand that, but I want to know how it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're all the fluffy stuff that's three minutes yeah. long. And oh, we just had a great time. I'm like, no, no, not every film production is like that. <laughs> I'm a big believer in that every movie ever made should get like an, like at least an hour, if not 90 minute behind the scenes document. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> like the a one- thorough documentary. <laughs> the one exception I, I recently came across was the recent release of The King's Man. It had oh, a minute okay. documentary on the making of, and I was like, The King's Man. <laughs> yes, I was like, man, what are you guys up to over there? Good job. Like, I remember renting Rise of Skywalker, the Blu ray, just to watch the documentary because it had, like, yeah. I think it was at least 90 minutes. So it was just about the whole making of the film and how they incorporated Carrie Fisher and like fascinating. I, I love all that stuff. Even smaller films, even movies like Slaughterhouse Five that not a lot of people know about. I'm always happy when bonus features show up. I remember when I rented uh, the Contact DVD and there were three audio commentary. <laughs> I, was like, I, I am in heaven. Jodie Foster talks over the movie for two hours, just herself. That's what you don't you see that anymore. That's what you want. <laughs> not to go too far off track or anything, but this is really cool. I, Scream Factory recently put mm-hmm. out a 4K of Alligator. Oh, and they, oh my gosh, really? They had a 25-minute interview with Brian Cranston, who was just a production assistant. He, <laughs> he came back to talk about his experiences on Alligator for 25 minutes, and it is one of the best <laughs> supplements I've seen in years. It was great. That's so cool. You know that they were looking through the IMDb, like who worked on this film and they saw his name and they probably thought, should we reach out? Like he (laughs) won't say yes to this. And And they probably were like, you know, my dad's classic saying, like, you don't ask, you don't get. I mean, you might as well ask if he says no, he says no. And maybe he was like, oh, that'd be fun to talk about. (laughs) I think he had a lot of respect for Robert Forrester and like his time. Right. So Mm -hmm. he he's always great about just looking back and on his past with pride. So that that was pretty cool. Yeah. I was collecting like every screen factory Blu-ray for a while. And it's been like three years. I need to get back into that because I love them so much. They're especially their box sets and everything. Absolutely. But um, yeah. So these, yeah. So when, as soon as you mentioned that the slaughterhouse five Blu-ray had (laughs) bonus features, that got me very excited, Uh, especially with these movies for the podcast that I'm researching and, look, you know, looking up all this trivia and thinking about and talking about with the guests, like whenever I see a possibility of like, oh, there's like that film I talked about even a few months ago has like a commentary, uh, Mm -hmm. like on Criterion channel. What was the movie? Oh, we talked about a Sunday, bloody Sunday last summer. 
the film with Peter Finch and Gloria uh, Jackson. And they, they uh, released it on streaming on Criterion Channel with like a commentary with all of these interviews. And I was like, I know I've already recorded the episode, but I want to watch every minute of this. This is fantastic. So that's, that's very cool. Uh, before we get to the movie, one last thing. Do you have any like favorite films of all time you can share with us? Like if you had to pick a few favorites that either ones you revisit all the time or just when you, when people ask you, like, what are the, what are kind of the go-to titles for you? Yeah, I have a couple. One that I've loved since childhood, and mm -hmm. I think it's a really great gateway to like bridge childhood with like adult movies. <laughs> and that is the classic Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Oh, okay. Because Very nice. it's the perfect blend of like, you have the animation that appeals to children, mm. but it's like kind of like a hard boiled noir <laughs> yeah, so, for adults. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a lot of fun on like, different levels. So mm -hmm. just I love the Bob Hoskins performance. I love the like invented blend of like animation and live action. Mm -hmm. There's a terrifying Christopher Lloyd performance that like haunted children for. Oh, yeah. Years. And like movie, terrifying at the end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to, to this day, you don't have to just be a kid. <laughs> I love it so much. I just, I revisit that movie often and yeah, it's, it's wonderful. I think what makes the ending, like those ending scenes with uh, Christopher Lloyd so scary for kids is I think when you're a kid, you don't quite recognize that they have animated his eyes. So yeah. it's like when you're young enough to like, you understand the difference between animation and live action, but it's like a human face, a real person, and then they animate his eyes and I'm not sure as a kid, you can differentiate that. And you think it's like real, like that's how his eyes look. And I just remember being horrified in that scene. When I, that movie came out when I was four, I probably saw it around four or five and it freaked me out. I think my mom had to turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> I was too scared at four or five years old. <laughs> yes, who, who would think a movie about an animated rabbit would just get so <laughs> not? <laughs> I'm always surprised they never made a sequel to that film. It was very popular. I think didn't yeah. it win like four Oscars. Like it was very popular. Yeah, they won a lot of technical, yeah, yeah. Work, which is pretty cool. It's it's interesting. You think like in 91 to 93, they would have had a sequel, <laughs> but they didn't. <laughs> That's a great film. Any others? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have to be standard and just uh, go to bat for Tarantino. I love the Kill Bill films mm -hmm. and uh, Inglorious Bastards with all my heart. Like, Oh, yeah. It, I, I just love his dialogue. I'm like, I'm saying nothing new about Tarantino. I'm not going to give any new insights. But <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> those movies are just so much fun. And I, mm -hmm. especially the Bill Bill films, I just oh, yeah. read them over and over and quote them with my wife. And <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I have been waiting. I guess he's never going to do it. I was waiting for like a really fantastic large Blu-ray release of the whole bloody affair cut of the movie. You never did that, right? Did you ever do that? Not yet. Like, he, I think <laughs> if he asked him today, he'd be like, yeah, it's still coming. It's still coming. Like in 04, weren't there just like the standard DVDs? And then in like 09, 2010, standard Blu-rays make a little bit, like there's like one deleted scene or something. And then has there been since like 2010, like, has there been like a really good release of that movie or no. either movie? No. <laughs> I've been in like loaded special release. Yeah. That Where is the loaded special edition? <laughs> the people who hate double dipping and who have just been waiting they're just like one day my time will come <laughs> i mean i feel like he, like he mentions it once a year like like oh yeah yeah we're doing that <laughs> well it <laughs> never never happens it's tarantino he mentions a lot of stuff <laughs> yeah but though yeah i remember i remember i saw volume two with my brother and he didn't like it because he thought it was slow and too talky and i'm like you need to you, you need to go watch some tarantino <laughs> Because that volume two was my favorite film of 04. I think today, I think Before Sunset takes it over because Before Sunset has now entered my top 10 favorite films of all time. And that got number two that year. So I think that would now be my number one. But that, I mean, I think the biggest disgrace is that because it was split into two films, Uma Thurman did not get an Oscar nomination. And I feel like if it had been one, one like three hour movie, I think she probably would have gotten in, but we'll never know. Yeah, that's a shame because she put like everything on yeah. the screen for that role. <laughs> she only, I believe she's, she only has the one nom for Pulp Fiction. I think that's it. And I feel like she, I mean, she's just such a dazzling actress, especially in Kill Bill. I feel like I, I would love it if she at least had that one actress nomination on, on her, uh, you know, her list of accolades. She's so good in that.
And she's like the whole movie. She's like both movies, like in every scene. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, talk about a, a worthy performance. I mean, over four hours, right? <laughs> it's yeah. pretty spectacular. She goes on such a journey. Like, yeah, physical and emotional, like really earns that ending with her daughter. I mean, you really earn that <laughs> in the movie, you know? Yeah, and the the final film I would want to mention as like one of my favorites is going back to the 30s and that mm. would be The Thin Man with William Powell and Myrna the Lord. Thin Man, oh yeah. yeah. Because I think they are probably the best on-screen couple of all time in my opinion. Mm. And I just love their chemistry. It's just such a fun, like fast paced mystery. And just like, even if you're not completely invested in the mystery, their chemistry is just insane. And I love them so much. Yeah, two or three years ago, I, I think I might've seen parts of The Thin Man when I was younger, but a few years ago on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day, TCM, uh, they played all six of them. I think there's six films and right. I just recorded them. And then over the course of a month or two, I just like would watch one every couple of weeks. And uh, boy, even, even the lesser ones towards the end, their chemistry is so great. Like some of the best film, like kind of screwball, like mystery comedy films of that era, really great. Yeah. Yeah. So if anyone hasn't seen The Thin Man, <laughs> get on it because it's <laughs> delightful. Yeah, that's a great choice. All right, so that takes us to our film today, Slaughterhouse Five. This came out in March of 1972. March of 72, that was a busy month for movies. I mean, you had, I mean, the big movie that month, obviously, was The Godfather, which came out at the end of the month. Uh, I mean, that movie kind of defined cinema for a while and was like, I think, the biggest hit to that time. Like in 72, there wasn't the blockbuster yet. Blockbusters did not really begin until Jaws in June of 75. But The Godfather was huge, like lines wrapped around the theater huge, right? Yeah, that was still back in the time where movies would play for months and months. So <laughs> I just to catch up. Yeah, I, I mean, I remember like Titanic playing in my theater 10 minutes away for like 10 months. <laughs> and you never see that today. I mean, especially now. Uh, but, yeah. you know, before 2020 even, like a, a movie staying in theaters for more than eight weeks you know, of, in recent years, it's a pretty big feat. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it must be like a giant movie. Like Avatar 2 is coming in December. Mm -hmm. That's what they say. <laughs> 2022. Well, and I'm like, I'm like, I wonder how long that'll be in theaters. Will it beat uh, Titanic? Probably not. <laughs> that was the last movie, Avatar, is what I was thinking, like, that I could remember at least four or five months, like, it was in theaters. Yeah. Well, what's hard is that now when it's a movie of that size, like a Star Wars Force Awakens, it'll open like in one multiplex, it'll play on like seven, eight screens. And so if you want to see it, you get in, you don't have to wait. Right? Like it's not like back in the day, I remember, you know, maybe it'd be on like two or three screens and that was a lot. Like now it's just like every screen. <laughs> so yeah. you don't have to wait for hours around the building. But uh, I don't think they were waiting in long lines for Slaughterhouse Five. What do you think? Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I do not think so, based on everything I've seen. This is such an unusual movie, watching this last night. I'm just like, what? Like, huh? <laughs> like, so this, I mean, obviously, it's based on famous uh, source material, and it was a very popular book at its time. It's not like they discovered this book in a, <laughs> in a pile of literature. They said, well, let's give this a try. And this was a very popular book uh, published in 1969, so it's just a few years after the release of the novel. Uh, for, our, for our listeners who might not know anything about this movie, I just wanted to give a couple sentences here, just a brief synopsis. Uh, so from his home in New York, optometrist Pilly, Billy Pilgrim narrates the tale of how he came to be unstuck in time, kidnapped by aliens, and living in comfort with his assigned mate, B-movie starlet Montana. Billy experiences the events of his life in random order, uh, going between his past as an American prisoner of war in World War II to his humdrum middle-class life in the present day to his future as a zoo curiosity on the planet Tralfamador. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yes, I wrote down in my notes, like phonetically, Tralfamador. Tralfamador. <laughs> It could have been harder. It could have been harder to say. Looking at that, I had not actually said that out loud yet, and I went, "Oh, this could be rough." 
<laughs> and I think we did okay. Good job. Uh, so yeah, this is like, I mean, for 72, there, there are chances being taken, but to see a character like span so many decades in time and having it not just go in linear progression, like to go back and forth the way this movie does, I cannot imagine audiences were used to that in 72. I don't believe so. <laughs> the thing I found really interesting about this movie is this was coming off of uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance mm -hmm. for George Roy Hill. Right. And he used that clout, which it was an immense success to make this completely like impenetrable movie to most audience members. This was like his version of 2001, A Space Odyssey, mm -hmm. basically. So just to release this in the theaters, it makes sense. Like even in a modern, like me from a modern lens watching this movie, I was a bit like, this was a movie when I got into it, I was like, am I dumb? Do I know? <laughs> do I understand what movies are right now? But it, it eventually I like got into the groove and understood what was going on. But I could understand, especially audiences back in 72, just not knowing what to do with this movie. Yeah, it like I've looked at, what have I looked at now? 14, 15 titles for 72 films. And there's really nothing like this one. Like we looked at uh, Silent Running recently, which is like a science fiction film with Bruce Stern. But that film is a, you know, it's pretty specific vision of space and his journey. It's all linear. This movie is just unlike anything I've looked at for the podcast. And it's, uh, I, I definitely had a lot I liked about it, but it, it was a bit of a struggle too at times because I'm like, a part of me just wanted the whole thing to be about his World War II experience because that those scenes, like were, th those were the ones I was really compelled by the narrative. And sometimes in this movie, I felt like I was being ripped out of the interesting things for especially the futuristic <laughs> elements that felt very weird and out of place. I don't know about you. Yeah, I, that would be something I would be interested in hearing your take on. Like, I'm not sure how far we're going to get into it right now, but mm. uh, just there's a lot of debate about, I mean, even from the novel of just whether the stuff on uh, Trophamador <laughs> is like literal did it actually happen or is it more of like a ptsd type oh, okay of, i would be curious of what you think oh yeah mm -hmm. yeah I, I i i never i mean i haven't read the novel so i'm not sure how it reads but it felt to me like this is a vision of him like i mean we see him and we give spoilers away on this podcast i don't you know <laughs> we see him get killed at the end i like i had i had thoughts like okay is this like a vision he's having like as he's dying or in his dreams towards the end of his life, because I feel like the the war scenes are so specific and literal. And like, if those scenes had more moments of fancy and like, you know, had moments of um, surrealism, like maybe I could think differently, but because those scenes are taken so literally, I'm like, I mean, that last, the last shot of the movie with the fireworks, I'm like, this is not happening for real, <laughs> right? <laughs> Did you take that last shot as happening for real? Um, I, I have a bad <laughs> habit of just buying into what movies are telling me. So, <laughs> okay. So I was like, yes, he was on uh, Trop Amador. He uh, was hooking up with uh, Montana Wild Hack, mm -hmm. and then he is experiencing. <laughs> he got imbued with this information of just knowing that all things are basically happening at once. So he was embracing like embracing mm. his death at the end because it didn't really matter because it's not an, a literal ending for him mm. because everything's happening at once. So I, I took the, like the culmination of his uh, conflict with Paul Lazaro, like as literal, like he had finally come back to avenge his friend as he had promised years before in the war. And it was just kind of an inevitability now it could still work even if he had not been in outer space on another planet, but <laughs> I, whatever he needs to get him to that Zen place where he's just, I mean, arguably Zen, like he is either suffering immense PTSD or he's reached mm. a high consciousness of understanding. Either way, he's, he's reached an end, I guess, that he's comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to say. Yeah. 
movie is a very perplexing movie or it's like one open for debate yeah the closest film we've looked at for the podcast for me that was like similar to this is from 71 called johnny got his gun the only film directed by dalton trumbo which is like about the horrific war experiences of a young man and it goes back and forth between the war experience to him basically like in a like a hospital like he's in a hospital room covered in bandages and you can't really see any of him and you're kind of like listening to his thoughts and it's a little bit surreal in the later segments and you're not quite sure if all of this is happening for real like I wrote it down uh, about halfway through I was like this kind of reminds me it's like it's got the same kind of look and style uh Johnny got his gun does not uh go into space (laughs) but otherwise it had some similarities to that which we talked about uh, oh geez that was about a year ago and um it's just like, you know, having, you know, a big fan of some of George, George Roy Hill's movies like Butch Cassidy and Funny Farm and some of these films I'll talk about at the end. I'm watching this movie. I'm like, this, so this is George Roy Hill. <laughs> it's not a film you would expect him to make at all. Absolutely not. Like whenever I saw who had directed this, like I knew of the movie. I just didn't know all of the behind the scenes people. And it's so interesting to see this just stand out so glaringly within his filmography, just like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Slaughterhouse Five, then The Sting. It's like he he retreated <laughs> back to, to what he felt comfortable with and what studios probably felt comfortable with. And also his insistence not to have basically any stars in this movie mm. did not help him. I Oh, yeah. I, I heard in one of the special features that like the stu- studios were hoping that maybe Robert Redford would come back and be the Billy Pilgrim Mm -hmm. character. But I think he would have been too, uh, like, Distracting? Yeah, like, (laughs) because the character of Billy Billy Pilgrim is such, he's such a passive figure, and it's about life happening to him Mm -hmm. consistently throughout this movie. And it's, like, all credit to Michael Sachs. Like, he didn't really have much of a career after this. He Mm -hmm. was, like, in... Sugarland Express and like a bit part in Amityville Horror but he was like I thought he was really good about just being a blank slate so people might think that he <laughs> he's not a good actor I don't know but like for this character like what Billy Pilgrim is supposed to represent from what I know I also have not seen or read the book uh, he seemed to be a good representation of just someone who is just uh mm checked out of his life basically like right. he he has so much baggage that he's not really ever going to stand up for himself or really do much like you never really know what's going on in his mind which is a really interesting like it's maybe may not make for the most interesting movie mm-hmm. but as a character like on I, I don't know he's such a perplexing character to me yeah I mean we can talk about that now I think Maybe my biggest struggle with the whole movie was that I found my dogs are barking. <laughs> I can't find any room in this house that's quiet. <laughs> really? Uh, so yeah, let's let me uh, talk a little bit about Michael Sachs. Mm-hmm. Had you had you heard of that actor before? Had he done anything before this movie? Um, I do not believe so. From what I remember from the special features, I don't think he'd really had much of a screen presence. Did they talk on the bonus features, like where he came from? Like, did he just, it was just auditioning and they just picked him or how did they, I wonder how they came across him. Yeah, I believe, because I don't want to confuse him with the actor who played his son, which I know they found him at like Mm -hmm. an acting class. But I, from what I remember, I think he had maybe been in like one other feature before this. Okay. Because I, I feel like, Robert Redford would have been worse. That would have been more distracting. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it needed like necessarily a star, but I found him as an actor very blank throughout the movie. And I, I, you mentioned, it almost seemed like that was the point. We didn't want someone with a lot of charisma. But like I think about last year's science fiction film, THX 1138, and the mm-hmm. star of that film is Robert Duvall, who's just an interesting person to watch. Yeah. And after about an hour, I just was like, I mean, Michael Sachs is in almost every scene and it's really just his film and his story. And I just didn't think he had enough to like carry you all the way to the end. 
there are moments in the film where there's just not a whole lot going on behind the eyes. And I'm like, uh, like, I don't know if that was George, George Roy Hill's intent, but uh, it, it, it was a struggle to get to the end because I just wasn't really involved with him as an actor. Like it, what he didn't have enough charisma to pull me through. Did you feel that at all or no? Um, I, I understand completely where you're coming mm -hmm. from. I, I'm not sure if I completely had as much of a problem with okay. it. I just kind of rolled with it, honestly. <laughs> like, I, I'm not sure if that's bad to say. Like, I, I just found him, how they built up the character and like in my mind, like they didn't really give you much of any backstory. Like the most they mm. give you is like one scene with his father throwing him in the pool and just saying basically mm. like or swim. So they had that scene. That was a good you, scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you realize that he does have kind of that underlying trauma from childhood, which also kind of uh, relates to how he, uh, re, um, how he relates to the character of Edgar Derby, mm. who uh, is kind of more of like a warm paternalistic uh, member of the, his troop um, who he really, he like even tells him at one point, like you, like you would be a really good father mm. is what, what he never really had. But then all the other times outside of the war that you're with Billy, you, he's with his wife who, uh, Valencia, who he doesn't really seem to care much for either way. He's like checked out completely from his family that he's created. The person, the, the being that he is most connected to, on like in the mm -hmm. real world is his dog that's the only thing <laughs> that's that right <laughs> about. and then otherwise he's kind of just like checked out of his own life he's like kind of dreaming up this dream girl of montana who uh is is she a real like she's a real person but she's basically what billy thinks mm. is his dream woman right and both of these women in the movie are like their own version of like outrageous caricatures. Mm. Like Montana is that person who is like the sex pod and like what quote unquote every man's fantasy would be. And his wife, like Valencia, who he has, she's so outrageous. She's uh, like a little bit like dowdy. <laughs> she's like very she's big like bigger than life she's like always just kind of like turned up to 11 with her mm -hmm. emotions but like <laughs> yeah. no matter what billy doesn't seem to care about any of it mm -hmm. and it's just I, I think that's kind of vonnegut's point okay just, mm -hmm. uh underlying how i like i don't want to give this movie a free pass for just like kind of bland <laughs> <laughs> but or maybe I'm reading too much into it but I think the point is that he was bland but I yeah maybe like if you could understand it more like you said behind his eyes maybe that would like help elevate the movie a little bit yeah there's just not a lot of emotion we get from him there's a lot of drifting and one of my big things of any movie, whether it's today or 50 years ago, is I need a, if we're going to follow a main character for two hours, almost two hours, like there has to be like a specific goal or a drive or something that they want and something that pulls you through that it's okay to, you know, have a nonlinear, you know, storyline and narrative and give me something new. That was kind of the part of the movie I responded to the most was having it be something I hadn't really seen in a long time. And I thought that was cool, but I just felt like there wasn't a whole lot of drive in him to get me to like, to, to, like I needed something to grab onto to get me through all of these weird jumps in time. And I couldn't quite, I couldn't figure him out. Maybe that's Vonnegut's point, yeah. Yeah, like <laughs> it's interesting to see how like small and nebbish and like polite he is like there's that scene <laughs> That's right. after he's been um they've been like marching forever and he's like on the verge of collapsing mm. and he like finally gets down into the dinner hall to like get his food and he like 
so badly needs to like eat some soup, but then like a guy <laughs> comes up and just starts talking to him and he doesn't want to be like impolite and like eat food while he's being talked to. And he's like on the verge of passing out while this guy talks to him. And then he just finally face plants into a soup because he's so polite. He just, <laughs> right. like, hold up, I need to eat. So it's just, that's kind of like indicative of his whole character. He's just like letting life happen to him. And that doesn't necessarily, like I said, make for the most dynamic movie. <laughs> like right. you're just following this person who everyone else around him's pretty interesting. Like there are a lot of really interesting characters around him. He himself is not, an interesting character at all it's it kind of reminds me of the film adaptation of catch 22 also a famous book from the 60s where the main character played by alan arkin in that film it, he's like he's i think he's a little bit more interesting than than who we get here but i feel like it's the ensemble it's everyone around alan arkin in the film catch 22 that's way more interesting and that you kind of respond to in that movie uh also a war film so there there, there are some ties to that too also by a very popular famous director uh, Mike Nichols yeah I'm sensing a theme here like you're saying Alan Arkin Robert Duvall these are all actors that we <laughs> can like who have won Academy Awards <laughs> they can elevate a performance and yeah. like no one knows Michael Sachs so like maybe there's a reason he just no well, I don't I and I don't want to pick on uh, I do I would never want to pick on an actor who didn't go very far and, and this is like his one big film I'm not I don't want to sit here and be like well you deserved it Michael I would never say that I yeah, yeah I just I'm all I try to be honest well I am honest <laughs> this podcast all the time and and I have to just yeah I have to say I mean I I don't I didn't really look and see like where his career went but I I felt like he would be a great actor maybe in like the second role of the movie. I don't know just to have him just be the face of this whole thing I did think the makeup they did for him was really effective. Like when they aged him, did you, yes. did that work for you okay, at all? Like I thought that worked really well. Like the first time we see him older, it was like, oh, like that, that did not, pull. sometimes in like the seventies, the makeup can be kind of, it can be a bit of a struggle. I thought the makeup effects for his aging in this were very good. Yeah. I found Michael Sachs has, or at least that time, he has such like an old face already. So right. I was like, Taylor made to make him look older so it, it, they did they did do a really good job just like seeing him as like a young soldier compared mm -hmm. to old there was enough of a difference to know that he was old but it wasn't distracting like yeah yeah it seemed and the slick back hair <laughs> it looked good so one person who really liked this movie was Kurt Vonnegut himself usually I feel like authors they bag on their movies if they're not like the screenwriter if they just if their novel was adapted I feel like a lot of them are like yeah nah, it wasn't very good like he liked it so let's talk a little bit about Vonnegut here as we, we move forward a little bit about the novel I wrote down a few things so the novel came out in 1969 uh, this was the book that catapulted Vonnegut uh, to literary fame uh, he wrote over the course of his long career he wrote multiple novels short fiction collections plays and non-fiction books he was a prisoner of war in World War II, captured during the Battle of the Bulge while a uh, battalion scout with the 106 Infantry Division uh, on December 22nd, 1944. He used these experiences uh, in writing his novel, Slaughterhouse-Five, when Billy is captured by the Germans and sent to a POW camp. Uh, Vonnegut in his novel, uh, Vonnegut also lived through the bombing of Dresden and used that experience too in the book. Uh, the book was published in early 69, became an instant surprise hit, spending 16 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list and went through five printings by July. So it was a big hit novel in 69. Yeah, I, I was very intrigued to know, like learn that Vonnegut spoke so highly of this, no or mm -hmm. this movie, just because like you said, that's not seemingly the norm for most writers. And he's, he particular seemed like he would be kind of. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know why I get the sense of this, but it, it's really interesting. Like I did read a quote where he was saying basically that the film captured what he was feeling mm. like while writing the movie. Mm -hmm. And like, I did find it really in, like interesting that 
although there was a few years between when it was published and when it hit screen, like the adaption hit screen, mm -hmm. like they had actually optioned it before it was published. So they didn't know it was going, going oh, okay. to be mm -hmm. And the producers just kind of saw, I think they were kind of looking for their own 2001 A Space Odyssey. Mm. Saying, okay, there's some like sci-fi elements, there's war. It obviously wasn't as big of a hit as Kubrick's movie, but mm. I could see where they thought that there would be that possibility of being a hit, but just did not quite get there. Yeah. So he this is, he said, I love George Roy Hill and Universal Pictures, who made a flawless translation of my novel to the silver screen. I drool and cackle every time I watch that film because it's so har harmonious with what I felt when I wrote the book. That's pretty high praise from someone, I don't know a lot about him, but as you say, it, he feels like the kind of writer, the kinds of things he writes, that he would like, he wouldn't have, be, he wouldn't have even wanted his book to be made into a movie, let alone say, oh, I loved it. <laughs> like, it just seems surprising to me, <laughs> but there you go. That's cool. I feel like most authors are like, yeah, yeah, don't ask me about that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Unless it's like a huge hit and everyone loves it, then they're like, then they take credit. <laughs> Absolutely. Like that you have to have good source material and have yeah. in order to something that good. So the movie uh, adaptation was written by Stephen Geller, screenwriter and novelist. He received a special jury prize at the Cannes Film Festival for Slaughterhouse Five. The film was directed by George Roy Hill. Uh, he uh, obviously did, you know, made some very famous films like Butch Casting, The Sundance Kid, The Sting, The World According to Garp, which was kind of like, uh, I would say that was Robin Williams' really big breakthrough in film. He had done Popeye before, but Garp showed his dramatic skills for the first time on film. So that's also a very important movie from the early 80s. This was something interesting I found. Michael Sachs uh, is 11 months older then his on-screen daughter, played by Holly Near, and he is four months younger than Perry King, who plays his son. <laughs> Whoa, okay. <laughs> so I'm assuming, like, that's like the older, when he's older, they yeah. made him up to look older. But they, that, I mean, for that to work as well as it does, considering they're all, like, the same age, that, that they did a good job, yeah. yeah the magic of makeup. <laughs> it's really as we said. Because of the boy who plays his son, like, he actually did play like the 13 year old version of him they just like made him up to look like a 13 year old boy and just like he like like <laughs> embodied a 13 year old but they just like no we're not going to get a kid to play this we're going to have the 20 something play a 13 year old yeah exactly so what else did we like about the movie not like about the movie what were some other other takes you had about the film um i will say like i might sound like a defender of this movie so far but i think have <laughs> I did have issues. Okay. Uh, I, this is probably because I'm looking at this through a modern lens mm -hmm. and I've seen so many depictions of war since like right. throughout my lifetime. But I think the larger point they were trying to get to regarding the horrors of war, I did not completely feel that they really hit it as hard as they could have. Mm, yeah. And I was trying to think of, if maybe back in 1972, if it would have like rang harsher than it, like seeing everything I've seen since then. But then I was remembering that like, I think it was in the sixties, like the human condition came mm. out um, mm -hmm. and that was just like brutal. And I, I mean, yeah, it may have not made for like the most commercial movie, but this already wasn't the most commercial movie. And I just feel that this, movie didn't really make me feel the larger point of like mm. him being haunted by his experiences and I'm not sure if that was because maybe some of the stuff they left out like they didn't I, I don't think they really needed to show the bombing of Dresden mm. but like maybe it was because he was such a passive character maybe but that like even in the moment, he didn't seem that affected by anything. So you don't really feel like he's haunted by anything in the future either. Yeah. Yeah. It's there, you know, it's a pretty cold film emotionally. And so I feel like if 
yeah, they wanted to showcase the horrors of war in that way. I don't think it's pulled off, especially when we have so many segments of him older that doesn't seem to tie in with the war scenes as well as they could have. And the movie's got scenes of like crazy zaniness that almost seems like out of a different movie. I'm thinking specifically of the car crash scene. Like what was yeah. going on there? <laughs> I was go- I was going to leave that as one of my favorite parts of the movie. Okay, because- no, I liked it, but it seemed kind of like out of a different film. Like I was watching like a Z- like a Zucker Brothers like airplane yeah. <laughs> or something. What was okay. that about? Are we watching Cannonball Run right now? <laughs> <laughs> Those guys are like, oh my god, she's coming back, and then they run, and then she slams into their car again. Yes, I. I cackled at that movie, like at that scene, and because I was like, "What is happening?" Because it was so out of sync with whatever, like everything else that was happening at that time. Yeah, like because she's trying to like meet him at the hospital yeah. after the plane crash, and it's just like she's screaming at the top of her lungs. She's hysterical, mm-hmm. and then of course, like through all of her, like I will go through hell or high water to get to my husband at the hospital. Like she ends up like killing herself basically like yeah. she <laughs> died from carbon monoxide poison and just like <laughs> it's just one of those things you're just like what is happening in this movie and like like i said i haven't read the novel so i had like no idea this was coming and i was like what happened right now that has to be in the book i don't know how it would be in the movie <laughs> like yeah. that scene like that feels like it was probably in the book and they had to yeah. translate it but i think they definitely hyped it up more in the movie to make it more like cinematic yeah because there's no way that she went like he described her going that crazy like up m- medians and like downhills and like it was a wild time but the, like this the filming of it itself is like at a heightened level of intensity versus like anything else in the movie like we see like the cameras like following the car going down the wrong side of the road and she's going backwards and forth and i'm like okay and it yeah it's a little bit like uh you know cannibal run just like crazy car stunts for one and a half minutes and just seems a little bit out of place in the hour and 45 minutes of this movie that's mostly kind of slow and thoughtful. <laughs> I don't know, it's just weird. <laughs> Maybe they wanted to make sure that the audience was awake, so they're like, give them this. <laughs> <laughs> it did kind of like alert me. I, went, I was like, oh. Because <laughs> there are stretches of this that are very just slow and you're like, where's this going? <laughs> like, yep. What's happening right now? Oh, okay, we have like a space vixen with her top off now, okay. <laughs> As, as one does. As one does. Uh, so yeah, that was an interesting scene. Uh, anything else, like anything else Roy, George Roy Hill brought to this movie? I, I would say if the Michael Sachs I struggled with, and for me, the other thing is, and I, I enjoy almost everything I've seen by George Roy Hill. I wonder if he was the right director for this. Because like we just talked about A Clockwork Orange, speaking of Kubrick. And that movie is so stylized and so haunting and hypnotic all the way through, even stretches of that film in the second half that are kind of slow, Mm -hmm. the the way Kubrick uses the camera and especially Malcolm McDowell's performance. I mean, he's just like fantastic in that. Speaking of charismatic, like a performer and a a character that you're not maybe supposed to like that much, but we like him anyway. Uh, And uh, I was like watching Slaughterhouse-Five. I'm like, what would Kubrick have done with this? I feel like Kubrick would have had a better handle on the transitions in the jumps in narrative time. And the way that George Roy Hill shoots the movie, it doesn't have like a personal stamp. It just feels like he's just shooting the script. And I feel like a movie like this, with this kind of ambition, you need to do a lot more than that. I don't know if you felt the same way. Yeah, I think Kubrick would have been a really interesting choice yeah. for this one. Um, just because, like you said, he is so precise mm-hmm. and like probably would have been hell on the crew, but it, <laughs> yeah. it would have made a probably a much more interesting film. Because like you said, like George Roy Hill is just, he's almost like a director for hire for this. He's just like, no, yeah. no personality to this. Yeah, I didn't see a lot of passion behind the camera. It wasn't like, there wasn't, it didn't need to have like crazy style from beginning to end but it just felt like there were scenes especially like even in space where it's just shot like you're watching just a normal drama and I'm like, i feel like there should be a little bit heightened uh level of of uh, style here that we are not getting yeah there were a couple shots that i mm-hmm. did really like appreciate or uh i thought were handled well 
like there was a like a dueling walk through the city shot like whenever they're first marching through uh the prisoners of war walking Mm. through the bombed out city and he's accidentally stepping on the guy's foot because he's not paying attention um i like how that is mirrored later when they're walking through dresden before it gets bombed and he's also Mm. doing like a similar look up at like the beautiful people like staring out the windows but it's not such a dour scene but i like how Mm. They kind of they kind of complement one another um because through that dresden scene i think that hill was trying to show how um there were real people on the ground at dresden and how uh mm. the atrocity of that whole bombing how like that city is just leveled afterwards and which i also think leads to a beautiful scene of or a horrific but beautiful scene of like the the soldier running through the bombed out city of Dresden mm. trying to like find his girlfriend who's like houses engulfed in flames. Like I, I did really like certain moments like that right. that were handled really well. There's a shot of him. Like, doesn't he see like bodies on the ground? Like, and he just, mm-hmm. and they're all pale and he just kind of, we just stay, kind of stay on his face mostly as he looks at them like that. I remember was a really haunting moment. And there are moments here and there that I really picked up on that. I liked, I would not dismiss this movie, but. I just was like, it could be a little bit more. <laughs> not not too much of the space stuff. We didn't need more of the space. <laughs> or maybe we did. Maybe the, like 80% of the film should have been in space. And then we just got these like little snippets of the war stuff. <laughs> maybe that would have been a different film. <laughs> yeah. But uh, one other thing I was missing in throughout the movie was the score. I really loved the score that played over the opening titles. It was like a little bit bubbly. And I went, oh, okay, so this is going to be a movie. It doesn't take itself too seriously. There was going to be like a mix of drama and comedy throughout the movie. And then it really, I mean, I guess outside of the, some of the stuff with that girl and the space scenes, like, I feel like for the most part, it was serious. And I remember towards the end, I'm like, you know, I haven't heard any music for a while. It's kind of like the music at some point got left out of the post-production process because I loved the score at the beginning. Yeah, it- it felt like they relied heavily on a lot of just like pre-existing classical music right. uh, to kind of that that almost felt kind of Kubrickian of just mm. uh, the horrors of war juxtaposed with like this like light classical like stately music um, and how that uh, was trying to yeah like I said like just a just juxtaposition of like the horrific right. beautiful I think was really like a nice touch but like you said it did kind of it wasn't consistent enough throughout the picture to be mm-hmm. like a super memorable score yeah like Kubrick uses classical music a lot in his films like we hear it a lot in 2001 and but I mean I feel like in Kubrick's films the music is a character even in like his last film eyes wide shut like when i think about that film like one of the first things i think about is the music that plays in that mansion that tom cruise goes into and i felt like this movie jumping ahead in time back and forth in time the way it does i felt like we needed like a through line with the score too and i was i felt that that was kind of a missed opportunity so i liked pieces of the film it's not one of my favorites of 72 so far I'm glad I watched it. It was an interesting kind of movie I haven't really watched yet for the podcast. I mean, we've had some kind of surreal movies. We had uh, Solaris. We talked about that recently. Also a science fiction film. Most of that film is in space and also plays with, I feel like like that film played with more interesting thematic ideas that I haven't seen in very many movies where, you know, the horrors of war. I mean, that's a topic that's in movies going back to All Quiet on the Western Front in 1930. It's not like it was anything new. So I admired some of it, but it makes sense to me, as you said earlier, that right after this, George Roy Hill jumped into the sting. <laughs> like, he, this movie, I don't, I, th- I don't think it bombed. Did it bomb? I mean, I don't think it did well. Like at the box office, I couldn't, did I find what, what, I don't think I could find how much it made. I don't think I could find like if it was successful or not. I don't think it I, was. I don't think it was successful. I'm not yeah. sure if it lost money, but it certainly mm-hmm. wasn't a hit. Yeah. It did well a few, so a couple months after its release, it played at Cannes. So it premiered at the uh, the 25th Cannes Film Festival. It won the jury prize and was nominated for the Palme d'Or. 
Uh, the film also won a Hugo Award for Best Dramatic Presentation and a Saturn Award for Best Science Fiction Film. Lead actor Michael Sachs was nominated for a Golden Globe for Most Promising Newcomer. This film also marked Sachs' film debut. This was his film debut. Okay. So he got a, so they don't, obviously they don't have that anymore. They haven't had that for decades, but back in the 60s, 70s, they had a most promising newcomer, male and female. And he was nominated for that. Apparently they did not agree <laughs> with you. And this film came out in March. So they had to remember back to March. Mm -hmm. Who are we going to nominate for newcomer male? Michael Sachs. Put him on the ballot. Uh, on the resume forever. But uh, I mean, I, the Golden Globes nominated Million Dollar Duck for two things. So <laughs> I wouldn't give them, you know, too much credit or. <laughs> but I, I am happy that it, like it played at Cannes and once like won an award there and was nominated for the Palme d'Or. I think that probably helped the movie a little bit, kind of stay in everyone's con like consciousness two months after its theatrical release. So that probably helped. That's all the trivia I have about the movie. Did you, is anything else I forgot to mention or that you looked up like, like bonus features wise, anything else about the movie that you found interesting you could share? Um, I will, this isn't really like a uh, trivia about the movie. There mm -hmm. were just a few couple like bit parts that I wanted to give a shout out to. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was just like, oh, that person, that person. <laughs> um, one of my favorite parts of the movie was the character of Wild Bill or nope wild bob cody okay who's the man outside the train who's just kind of talking to all of the soldiers and kept trying to like almost give them a pep talk and <laughs> just like right. avoid like them going on the train mm -hmm. and that was played by roberts blossom who plays okay. the old man in home alone uh for people who remember oh who was he in home alone the old man who like uh, kevin's afraid of the oh whole right yeah. oh is that who that was it was bothering me the whole movie Yes. He's, he's the old guy in Home Alone. <laughs> yeah. There we go. <laughs> and whenever you were talking about uh, Billy looking at bodies on the floor, like that's whenever you see Wild Bob, like, okay. like, like oh, Bob didn't make it. That's sad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I also want to point out um, Sorel Book, um, who plays uh, his father in law, who he gets in the plane crash with. Okay. Um, he plays uh, Boss Hog on the old Dukes of Hazard. Oh, okay. Yeah. So interesting. I would not have known that without the commentary because he was kind of <laughs> using a very different mode there. Um, so, did you listen to the, all of the commentary track? The historic, like, what did he? He was just obviously he recorded a commentary track, so he must love the film, right? He's talked about all the great things that the film does. Correct. This is how I know, like, a lot of like the little <laughs> bitty details because the first time I watched it, I'm like, I'm confused. And I was like, I'm going to watch it again. Let me listen to it with a commentary and try yeah. to like gather my thoughts because I did not want to come here and look like a complete idiot. Maybe no. I'm like over talking about it now. Like, I, I studied for this. I need to let everyone know. But um, I, hmm. oh, one thing I did learn like mm -hmm. Kurt Vonnegut almost had a cameo in this movie oh he did yes um the guy who uh is in the hospital bed who is talking about um why it was a good thing to bomb Dresden and why it was a necessary evil and kind of giving that alternate point of view of just like this needed to be done that was supposed to be Kurt Vonnegut oh, okay but apparently he was too nice and he couldn't get like kind of that like like quality that irks people like that he could not like portray that so they had to get like another actor to come in and like be kind of like that kind of um mm -hmm. malicious like tough guy because Vonnegut could not pull it off which oh, I but he good. actually was called to set and, and actually they shot film of yeah him. he filmed it and unfortunately and they didn't, and they didn't use it but like yeah he was supposed to be Oh, and also um, <laughs> one other fun fact, um, the voice of the Tropamadorian who's talking to him in like the little uh, prison they have him in basically, that was George Roy Hill. Oh, okay. Yeah. Little little Hitchcock cameo there. <laughs> yeah. <but I laughs> so, wow. So Vonnegut's not a, like he shot a scene in the movie that got deleted, that got 
not deleted, but they they filmed it with a different actor, and he still raved about the movie. He's still cool with it. <laughs> I feel like that would have been a sore subject. Like, oh yeah, I even like spent a day like on the set, and then they didn't use it. They hired some other guy because I wasn't good enough. Like, you think that, <laughs> that's what he would have talked about in his quote about the movie? <laughs> that's that's fantastic. It did. I don't know about you. It did not necessarily this book, but watching the film, like because it is so interesting in its narrative structure, it did intrigue me to finally go to the library, get a couple of Vonnegut books and read some of his work. I still have never read a single Vonnegut book. And so it made me kind of interested to start reading his his stuff. Yeah, I'm pretty much the same way. I have several Vonnegut books just gathering dust on my bookshelf. Oh, you do? Okay. I'm the type of person who I'm an aspirational reader. Like yeah, in my here. mind, I'm like, I'm going to get these books. I am going to read them and I'm going to be so well read. And then mm -hmm. of course, what do I do? I just throw in another Blu-ray into the Blu-ray player. <laughs> All right, let's go. And I'm just like, what is wrong with me? Why do I do this to myself? Yeah, December, I went to a bookstore in Seattle and I think I bought 12 books and it's, we're recording this in March and I've read one of them. And then in February, I got like 10 more books and I have not gotten to those. <laughs> it's, I, I'm that compulsive, like when I, if I'm in a bookstore, I get very inspired and I'm going to read a lot. I'm going to write a lot. And I walk out with my bag and I'm like, yes. And then like on the plane flight home, I'll start one. <laughs> and then life gets in the way. <laughs> and then three weeks later, I'm like, I haven't even gotten back to that chapter. <laughs> it's just, it's, I wish, I wish there was just more time, you know? <laughs> to read reading is the hardest thing for me to find time like outside of like 10 minutes in the morning before I get ready for work I, at night I used to be able to like sit and read until I like 1 a.m when I was like in my 20s I could just like lay in bed and read now I my head hits the pillow I'm out <laughs> at night so especially on work days when I've just you know I've been working hard at my job for eight nine hours and you know it's been a long day and I make dinner and <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm going to read some Kurt Vonnegut and then pass out. <laughs> That's so my it's hard. Yeah. And then on the weekends, it's like, I'm watching films for the podcast. I'm watching films for my YouTube channel. I'm just, I'm always like working on stuff. And it's hard for me to just set aside 30 minutes to, to just sit and read. It's hard mm -hmm. for me to justify that. I don't know about you. <laughs> I'm the same way. My <laughs> mind is like so scattered all the time that I just like, it just, it makes sense for me to just like focus on a screen and like trying to like, <laughs> focus on work. it's, it's awful. I feel horrible about it, but it's the truth. Yeah. And that, you know, that ADD reality of like, well, if I watch something, I can like look at my phone and I can do stuff. I can even work on something while the movie's playing. But when you're reading a book, you can't, you have to just read or else you, you, you lose sight of what's happening. <laughs> so yeah. there is that too, yeah. but I, I am going actually going to the library next week. I, I'm going to pick up at least one Vonnegut book. I'm going to read it. <laughs> I'm going to read it. <laughs> Just give it a shot. Even if it's not, I think he had a couple more adapted to film. I know Breakfast of Champions. Isn't that him? Yeah. The film that was made with uh, uh, Bruce, Bruce Willis. Willis. Mm -hmm. And Nick Nolte, is he in that too? I want to yeah. say. I think Nick Nolte might be in the- is that, uh, a, is that another one? <laughs> I think that might like- something midnight i believe like oh is that the one uh, the one from like 90 is that mother night that's it is that right yeah. is that is that uh vonnegut uh, yes it is okay interesting yeah i worked uh i worked in uh, casting for two years and i want to say that the woman i worked for she cast that movie so i think she had a poster in her office of that movie <laughs> So that's there's a tie to fun fact. <laughs> fun fact for you all there. Yeah. Casting, working in casting. That's an interesting, I'll, I'll do another podcast episode about that experience I had. I have some crazy stories to share about those two years. Uh, so yeah. So as we get to the end here, uh, anything else you wanted to share about the movie, things you liked or anything else before we get to the last question I have about the movie? No. <laughs> I was looking at your notes. Uh, anything in your notes that you didn't mention yet? no i'm not gonna shoehorn anything i'm good <laughs> yeah but yeah i mean overall i i would give it so i do the the roger ebert gene Siskel four stars and i would give this movie two out of four it was like an interesting watch i won't ever watch it again unless i had access to that commentary 
that you mm-hmm. listen to. I would actually love to watch the movie with that commentary to give me, I bet that would actually help me appreciate the movie more as most commentaries do with films I struggle with. Usually, yeah. I mean, that happened with me on Citizen Kane when I was younger, I struggled in Citizen Kane. I'm like, how is this the best movie ever made? And it wasn't until listening to Roger Ebert's commentary where he, he I mean, he just like, he talks over every frame of that film and gives so much interest, so, so many interesting uh, anecdotes and research and talking about every shot and just and I went oh this is why <laughs> so sometimes yeah. it takes a really knowledgeable uh, film historian to talk over a movie for its two-hour running time and I can maybe not love the film but I can appreciate it more than I did before I think that would be the case with this one yeah absolutely I think my first viewing um, a couple nights ago I was right where you are like a two out of four but then when I watched it again, like even kind of separating what the commentary was telling me and just kind of viewing the film, it moved a lot faster than okay. I was mm-hmm. like moving and it made more sense because I kind of knew where it was going. And I think it bumped it up to like a three out of four for me. Oh, good. Okay. Like it got better the second time for me. So if 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 you do give it a second chance, I'd be mm-hmm. interested to hear. Yeah. But, no, I would, I, if I had access to that commentary, I would definitely listen to it and watch it again. Uh, I mean, I did appreciate that. Uh, what is it, an hour and 43 minutes, something like that? I, I appreciated that it wasn't two and a half hours long. <laughs> Absolutely. That would have been a slog. <laughs> you know, like Kubrick can get away with that. Like a Clockwork Orange is, I believe, two hours and 15 minutes. And I think on that episode, I talked about how it is a little long, but it's just so interesting all the way through. Like it doesn't, you don't feel the length as much as I think I would have felt it with this one. <laughs> if George Roy Hill had made his three hour epic. I think it might have been a bit much. So I, I, I appreciated the, the shorter running time. But so my last question about the movie is if they were to adapt Slaughterhouse-Five, the novel, uh, into something today in 2022, like what do you think, how would this movie look now? Like what would they do with it today, do you think? Okay, I gave this some thought. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this is exactly what you're asking for, but based oh, on fine. based on the source material, it seems a that the adaptation was about as good as it could be. And I okay. don't think the amount of like updating special effects or anything like that would really save or make it monumentally better. Mm. My idea is, I'm not sure how this would work. I'm not a screenwriter, but um, I would take kind of like a Damon Lindelof Watchmen approach. Oh and yeah. Try to use some of the themes or like the world's of slaughterhouse five and adapt it and maybe tackle some modern themes mm. and like w- within society and i would want to, this to be brought to life by the team of brit marling and that zal batman Leach, but since they've done the oa and sound of my voice which does some like oh okay travel stuff i think they would be like a fantastic group like pairing to bring something insane to life with Mm -hmm. this source material yeah i think in the right hands this could be really like a sensational property like in 2022 i think there's like zero percent chance it would be a film i think it would be a like a streaming like an episodic six seven eight episode series like how long was Watchmen? was that nine episodes i want to say that was Uh, a little bit longer i think Uh, but like yeah in the hands of of in, you know some of these HBO series I watch, I get I'm absorbed every minute. I think Slaughterhouse Five is a title that has like like some people like maybe not everybody, but I feel like a lot of people know that title. Even if you don't know the book, you don't know the film, you don't know a lot about Vonnegut. I feel like there's there's something about that title that tells me this might get another version in the next five to ten years. I mean, it happened with Catch Twenty Two. Catch-22 film from 1970, and then George Clooney took it on and made, I think it was, a, I think it was only five episodes. I think it was short. I think it was like five episode adaptation. What was that? Was that, I think that was in 2020 that dropped on Hulu, I want to say. I believe so. And I had some issues with it, but it, so, some stories don't need six, seven, eight episodes. I've said that before. I think this, I think this property would benefit from having like episodes that like like paid attention to just like one element of the story and built on the character. And maybe they got like a really great actor for that lead role and took its time and let the story develop over a few episodes. I think I would enjoy it more. 
there's something about cramming it all into the hour and 40 minutes. I, I'm not sure if that's the tactic I would take in 2022. I think I would do like a longer kind of series and even just, you know, it could be like 45 minute episodes, but I feel like a dropping on like a HBO max or a Hulu, I think it would get a big audience. I think people would watch a modern adaptation of slaughterhouse five. Yeah. I think it could lead to some really interesting avenues. I like, I remembered reading that actually back in like 2013, uh, Guillermo del Toro actually announced this as one of like his pro like famed projects that he never actually completes like he said oh, he, was, he makes, was working on it yeah but it's just it's never materialized mm. almost years later so it's it's a property that's still kicking around Hollywood so don't be surprised if it does come up yeah eventually. some some films we've talked about I'm like I would put it at a 0.1 percent chance this ever gets remade I think Slaughterhouse Five of the fourteen or so movies I've talked about for seventy-two, I feel like this one has some one of the higher shots of being remade in the next five to ten years. It would not surprise me if by the end of the decade we got something. Like I feel like there's enough title recognition, like they might be like, "Oh, let's make that." I think it's the most recognizable title of all of Vonnegut's books, right? Absolutely, I would think so. And I think I looked up his uh, his list of books. His second to last book was Hocus Pocus. I don't think they're going to do that as a film. <laughs> is that not what Hocus Pocus did? <laughs> no. Like, I, I'd love to see a director today, like make his novel Hocus Pocus into a movie and call it Hocus Pocus. <laughs> <laughs> There'd be some confused people in the audience, you know? Mm -hmm. Where, where's Bette Midler? What is this? <laughs> so that takes us to the uh, final two segments here. Uh, the first one is called The Divine Double Feature. That's where we pick a more modern film to pair. So this movie ends. There's time for one more movie that's thematically similar or similar in genre or the way the story is told. Like, what what would you recommend to someone to put on right after this ends? Okay, so my <laughs> thinking is, instead of, like, picking, like, a legit good movie okay i think that this movie would scramble my brain enough that it would maybe help me better understand certain movies that i think are flawed but there's like something in there that's like has potential oh, okay mm -hmm. so i had like two movies in mind that that could possibly fit that bill one is this movie from 2020 i believe called flashback with dylan o'brien which is a really kind of i don't know that one it's like Dylan O'Brien and Micah M Monroe, and it's kind of like a similar plot where it's like a guy is living simultaneous versions of his life at the mm, same time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of that concept. Um, so that has potential. And the other one is like a spectacular failure, but I have kind of a soft spot for it. And that would be uh, Southland Tales. Oh, the oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> If only just to see uh, Justin Timberlake sing the killers again. And <laughs> Does he sing like the like, whole song? <laughs> yes, it's insane. But it's it's not a great movie. I just watched it again last year, but it's super interesting. And there's something there, like there there's something about that movie. There's like elements of the movie that have been intentionally left out because mm -hmm. like you wanted to fill it out with like graphic novels. So it's like super perplexing but i think if my mind was on this wavelength it could possibly like <laughs> maybe unlock something that's interesting i want a feature length documentary about the career of richard kelly because mm -hmm. what happened there <laughs> <laughs> he makes donnie darko it came out like right after 9 11 so it didn't do well that was a film that took off on dvd on home video and yeah. that's how i watched it and was one of my favorite films of its time and I feel like over the course of a few years, got enough clout that he was able to just make his second feature anything he wanted. And he makes Southland Tales, which I saw at the Los Angeles International Film Festival in November of 06 with a giant crowd. And you could just like feel <laughs> about half an hour in, you could just like, like feel just everyone kind of going, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I liked it more than others did. I'm always on board because I, I made films. I, got, I went to film school. Like I am always on board with someone taking chances and doing something big and failing. And that's fine. Like I'd rather that than someone just play it safe for two hours. Like give me something big, go for it. Sometimes it doesn't work. That's okay. The ensemble in that movie was extraordinary. And so I had things I liked about it, but 
it was a huge failure in every regard. And then he made one more film with Cameron Diaz, I want to say, The Box. The Box. And yeah. then that's it. Has he directed another movie? I don't think that, I, I think he's disappeared, didn't he? I don't he, remember anything after The Box. Maybe he, maybe he turned to screenwriting. Maybe he's written some stuff. But he kind of faded I away. <laughs> I haven't uh, taken yeah. a dive into Richard Kelly's filmography lately. Yeah. But I'm glad it's the first time Southland Tales, that title has come up on the podcast in a year and a half. So thank you. Uh, I like, I absolutely love Sarah Michelle Gellar. And she was like my, like when I, when I saw that she was playing a porn star in that movie, I was like, when is this coming out? I'm going <laughs> opening day. <laughs> they do, that's another career. I mean, she, you know, I, I'm sure she's doing fine, but I thought after Buffy, she was going to be a big film star and she was in The Grudge and she was in a couple things. And then that kind of faded too. Like she hasn't had a big movie in a while. And so uh, I think about her a lot and her career and kind of miss her on TV screens, on film screens. And uh, it was fun to see her play a porn star in that movie. It was just interesting. And The Rock before he was really like famous at, at the, like the movie level. We're mm -hmm. like five years away from really him reaching a level of fame there. I believe I read once that he was paid $50,000 for his role in Southland Tales. <laughs> I remember reading that once and I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I was like, really? Okay. And um, you see uh, Janine Garofalo for three seconds, right? Dancing and that's it. Because she was, her, the rest of her part was deleted. <laughs> You have like Amy Poehler, Sherry O'Terry. Sherry like O'Terry. <laughs> uh, Sean William Scott, I remember, was really good in the movie. Yes. So yeah, that's a great that's a great choice. I would love I would love to be a fly on the wall for someone, you know, getting some takeout and you get a glass of wine and they settle in for a night of uh, Slaughterhouse Five and Southland Tales. <laughs> I would love to then, as Southland Tales, the credits roll. We, we we turn the lights up and then both of us, me and you, we we, we talk to that person and, and ask them how it went. Yep. <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> that would be a follow-up episode. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if any of you out there want to want to give it a go, like reach out to me on Twitter at Film of 50. Like let me know how it went. <laughs> All right. So yeah, my choice is I I was trying to think, I was like, why can't I I spent 10 minutes? I was like, how can I not think of a movie? that's about one character like played by the same person like in three different parts of their lives I could not think of one I finally googled and I couldn't find anything I'm maybe it'll come to me in a few days so I'm like I know I've seen a movie where it's the same actor like in his 20s in his 50s and his 80s and you see like his whole life I know I've seen something like it's like kind of on the but I can't think of it so I would like just Benjamin Button or something. <laughs> Benjamin Button, which is backwards. Yeah, that wasn't what I was thinking of. I was like, I know I've seen like a drama, like that you see a guy played by the same person. But I couldn't think of it. So I just went with one, like what, what like, one of the films of the last 10 years that really was taking a risk with its narrative structure, also based on a famous book. Uh, so I went with uh, 2012's Cloud Atlas, okay. uh, which was not my favorite film of that year, but boy, is that movie taking big risks and doing interesting things with its narrative and you know, many actors playing multiple roles in that movie. And I'm a huge Tom Hanks fan. I love Halle Berry. Um, I have to revisit it again. I saw it opening weekend. I liked it. It wasn't my favorite film of the year, but I occasionally think about it here and there. And I, my friend read the book and she loved it. So I thought one of these weeks when I have time, <laughs> which I don't know when that'll be, uh, I would love to read the novel and watch the film again. It's, you know, so it's been... It's been 10 years, it came out in 2012. So this would be a good chance like on its 10 year anniversary to read the novel and watch the film again. It's been a while. Have you seen Cloud Atlas? I have not. It's been one okay. of those like, mythical films on <laughs> where people are like, this is a masterpiece. And I'm like, I need yeah. to get it. It's just like, who, who has the time? It's like the same, <laughs> the same time I'm going, going to go sit and read that book, I guess. Yeah. Well, I, if not the book, def, I would definitely recommend you on its 10th anniversary, I would recommend you watch the film. Like, just give it a chance. It's it's really out there. It's wild. Uh, Hugh Grant is really great in it. He plays multiple roles. I remember he was really good. It's got a really good cast. And it's just one of those films that's rarely made. Like, just like, just like throwing a thousand ideas at you and not all of it works, but it kind of reminded me in like a much more extreme way <laughs> of uh, Slaughterhouse-Five. So I would go with Cloud Atlas. So that would be my choice. 
Uh, so yeah, maybe have a really crazy night and watch all three. Oh, Slaughterhouse okay. Five, Southland Tales, and with Cloud Atlas. See how you're doing. <laughs> that is a long strain <laughs> without a break. <laughs> <laughs> like live tweet <laughs> as you watch all three i feel like slaughterhouse five would come off as much more just tame and basically just like a quiet movie about a guy and like compared to the other two yeah would, would not even be in the same ballpark so that takes us to our final segment on director george roy hill so you said like you've seen a couple of his films but not the ones that everyone knows and has seen so what are the films of his you've seen outside of slaughterhouse five yeah, I feel shame that I haven't seen Butch Cassidy and the Sundance. <laughs> Considering I co-host a podcast about the Sundance Film Festival, <laughs> it's a very shameful blind spot. But uh, I have seen, <laughs> I've seen some uh, films that I do like from George Roy Hill. Okay, I really like. Uh, I think it's the 1982 romance, uh, a little romance, a little romance, seventy nine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah okay 79 with uh a, a baby diane lane and it's such a charming movie mm -hmm. I love it. and it does have like a like an older kindly laurence olivier in a right. role as well. mm -hmm. and uh, i discovered that through the warner archive blu-ray and it just charmed me so much i just really loved like yes it is too long it's very much too long <laughs> but um it, and that's a problem I have with some of other uh, George Roy Hill projects, but I do find it to be like just a really nice, lovely, like adult, well, not adult, but like mid-budget romance, like about childhood yeah. romance. And it's very sweet. I love it. I think that was one of those films that I came across. I think Roger Ebert gave it a four-star review and uh, it had a young Diane Lane, an actress I've always admired. I think she's great. And I just remember, I think it played on TCM some, and I recorded it. And I watched it and I really loved it. That was a great film. That's a great choice. Anything else you've seen by him? Yes. Um, it's been a while since I've seen this one, but I did really enjoy Thor Thoroughly Modern Millie. Oh, okay. With Julie Andrews? Yes. Um, because, yes, Julie Andrews and Mary Tyler Moore are both in it. <laughs> That's right. And just seeing those two on screen together just warms my heart. And it has like a lot of great like song and dance numbers. Once again, about... 30 minutes too long like it's like a two and a half hour movie and it did not need to be <laughs> he has a problem with length hey at least uh, slaughterhouse he kept uh, it short <laughs> merciful yes but i i did really i did like that movie just for like the singing and dancing just like seeing julie andrews and mary tyler moore on screen like i think once again like that's not what i would expect from george george roy hill but mm -hmm. he did a really good job with the yeah, he's definitely a director. I didn't mention this before. He's a director that tried different genres. Not every director is able to do that. Like I, I admire a director who's able to kind of bounce around and be successful doing different things, doing a musical, a drama, a Western, a science fiction film, comedy. I mean, he, he did really bounce around, didn't he? Yeah, you have to respect someone who's just like, I'm going to just play in all these different sandboxes. Mm -hmm. And like, not everything works, but he was just on a journey and it's better than being boring, I guess. What would George Roy Hill have done with a really scary R-rated horror film? That's, I would have liked to have seen that. <laughs> it would have been it. very matter of fact. It would have been very slow, like a haunted house film or something. <laughs> like I, I told you before this, like I listened to your Play Misty for Me episode mm. and talking about how like Clint Eastwood did that one thriller and nothing else. Like I could imagine George Roy Hill making like a really good thriller or horror film and just- Just a one-off. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Rob Reiner did it with Misery. You don't have to be a master like Hitchcock, like make 40 suspense films. Like, like if you have a great story and you're a talented director, I think anyone can make a really terrific, if not a horror film, at least like a thriller, like a suspense film. I think he would have had it in him. Like, like if he had directed like The Changeling with, uh, with George C. Scott, I could have seen that being like a George, Roy, George Roy Hill movie. Because he, I mean, he had, he was a talented director. He could do a lot of different things. I didn't think he was all the way successful with this uh, Slaughterhouse Five. But I mean, any director who has like two or three great films and they're different genres, I'm always really, I always really admire that. Absolutely. Yeah. I, and he is a director, like 
especially after this, even though it wasn't a complete success, like I do want to just go see everything that I haven't seen from him, especially mm-hmm. since I'm missing most of the major ones. Yeah, but... Maybe start with Butch Cassidy. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's a great film. That's noted, okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's fine. So your podcast is on Sundance Film Festival just on like the latest crop of films from Sundance or do you go back to like previous years? Yeah, um, the podcast is the Home Dance Film Festival. It's myself okay. and my wife. And oh, cool. every every episode we talk about two Sundance movies and then a non-Sundance film just to like give other like newer options a chance. But it's like any movie that played at Sundance, we'll talk about those. And then just any other film we just feel like spilling our guts about. And it's just a lot, but like the Sundance oh, cool. Festival means a lot to me. And I just that's always been like a film festival that I I'm drawn to. And like, it's some of my favorite films are from the Sundance film festival. So it just made sense for us to just like really dive into that world and just like embrace our love of. Oh, that's awesome. So yeah, those are all great choices. I mean, George Roy Hill, I mean, he started making films in the sixties. He was directing all the way to the eighties. He has some really terrific titles. If I had to pick my three favorites. So the Sting I saw once when I was in high school. I don't remember it that well. So it's not going to be in my top three just because it's been so long. And I might have even watched it for this, but I'm watching it next year for the podcast that came out in 73. So I'm going to do like a long episode about The Sting in a few months time. So we'll get to that down the road. Uh, my top three would be The World According to Garp, which is a wonderful film. Robin Williams and Glenn Close's first movie. It's her first film. Her first Oscar nomination, she's terrific in that, uh, based on the John Irving novel. And uh, I didn't see it until maybe three or four years ago. I was doing like a little bit more of a deep dive into Robin Williams' career, and I had never seen that. And he's wonderful in it. It's a great, just kind of human story, has some comedy in it. I believe, is, uh, I think um, John Lithgow is in that one too. Like just a really terrific film. That'd be my number three. Have you heard of that film or seen that film? Um, this is once again where my collector brain kind of insert <laughs> enters the conversation. I have most of George Roy Hill's movies on physical media. Like oh, you I do? have the I have the Warner Archive Blu-ray of World According to Garp. Oh, and okay. The Sting on 4K, but I still have not seen these movies. I'm just like <laughs> aspirational. It's more yeah. it's more within the realm of possibility than some of these books, but like it's just like I want to watch that, so I'm gonna go ahead and buy yeah. it. It's like uh, I've had on my shelf uh, Scream Factory's Class of 1984. I've had that on my shelf for six months. And I look at it at least once a week. And I'm like, I, I'm going to watch that. Let me find two hours this weekend, Brian. I'm going to watch. And I just never, <laughs> I just never have time. So sometimes it's a matter of a, but I would highly recommend The World According to Garp. My second favorite is Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. I think that's probably, even though the, like the film he was more successful at the Oscars was, uh, was the sting I think Butch Cassidy might be his most famous film like if like I feel like that's the title I mean I don't know that'd be a really interesting like you picked a hundred random people like would they know Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid more than the sting because the sting was obviously very popular too I just feel like because of the Sundance Film Festival and just like everything around that was their first pairing together I feel like that movie might be slightly more famous but that was really what I feel like boosted his film career as a director was Butch Cassidy. Great film, great movie all the way through. And a very tragic and famous final scene. And uh, just what a, what a pairing of those two, like having Robert Redford uh, and Paul Newman together in a movie. And the fact that we got two great films with them, really cool. Absolutely. Like I, I, like I said, I feel bad for never having seen it, but it's one of the <laughs> I want to watch so badly. It's just so many movies, so many movies. There's all so the many movies, so little time. Yeah, but definitely give that one a shot. But my favorite film, this is very rare. I know Quentin Tarantino has been talking about for years that he doesn't want to keep directing movies forever and ever because many directors, they don't, they don't have a great lineup of their last three movies, right? He talks about Billy Wilder a lot, who had just an extraordinary career. He directed my, fav- my favorite film, uh, Sunset Boulevard, and has so many great movies like Some Like It Hot and The Apartment. But his last movie is Buddy Buddy. <laughs> and it's like not a great way to go out. 
Tarantino talks about how he just wants to make one more movie and be done. We'll see if he sticks to that. But yeah. here's the case of a director, George Roy Hill. My favorite of his movies by far, I would say, is his last movie. Funny Farm. <laughs> that is wild. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite Hill film is Funny Farm with Chevy Chase. I love movies about writers. This film came out in 1988 and it was playing on, I, want, I think it was probably HBO like for most of my young life and I just it was one of those early kind of adult comedies that I would watch over and over and uh it's what I, I would not in the top 20 but I would say in the top 30 of my favorite comedies ever is Funny Farm that might be my favorite Chevy Chase movie I love that film and that's I the last that. movie he directed <laughs> that's so interesting like I Funny Farm would have been my third film that I would have listed okay. I who like that movie i've just heard so many people bash it all of my life that who like, bashes funny farm <laughs> i don't know i just i just hear people say that it's not a good movie so i thought i might have been in the minority of just being like no i thought it was pretty funny like i enjoy it and i i really like the recurring gag of the mailman that always <laughs> yeah. makes, me laugh. makes me laugh every time <laughs> so ridiculous and then correct me if i'm wrong doesn't it turn into like an unexpected Christmas movie by the end? Yeah, the third act becomes a Christmas film. Yes, so I love that too. So I'm all about <laughs> holiday films. I approve of your choices. I just love that story. Like, okay, I'm going to write my classic American novels. We're going to move to the country and the quiet life and everything's going to work out great and nothing ever does. And it's got a great ensemble. It's like the, it's not the, you know, kind of airplane kind of style humor. It's quiet comedy. It's like, I mean, there's a couple of things like with that snake or whatever that comes out of the water, <laughs> but like the joke of like the, them getting the dog and they come home and they like, you know, they got their arms around each other as they watch the dog go down to the lake and they're smiling and it's like, you know, cheery, uh, cheerful music. And then the dog just keeps running and then it just, <laughs> the dog leaves and they're like, oh my God. And then he like goes and searches for the dog for four hours, comes home. And he's like, yeah, I couldn't, couldn't find it. <laughs> it's just like all these, it's like situational humor all mm -hmm. the way through the testicle scene, the testicle the food scene <laughs> is so hilarious. I just love that movie. And then it does, you said it becomes a Christmas film at the end. It's like the Christmas movie he made right before Christmas vacation that not as many people know about, I want to say. So if there's one, I mean, obviously Butch Cassidy is like an iconic film and probably most people would list that as his best film. It's more of a, just a personal thing for me. And like, if I had to watch one of these right now, when we finish recording, if I had to put on one, it would be funny far, like not even a question. <laughs> so, and I'm kind of like hot and cold on Chevy Chase. I don't know about you, like some of his films, especially his later films are pretty rough. But he had a string there, like there's some good ones in the 80s, like Fletch and of course the vacation movies. And I just, I think he was perfect casting for Funny Farm. I just think it was the right time in his career. He's not overplaying it the way sometimes he does in some of his comedies. Like I just love him in this and great movie. Highly recommended if you've never seen Funny Farm. Yeah, you make me want to like <laughs> go watch it again. Like I do, I did really enjoy it, but now I just want to watch it again. <laughs> Yeah, it's fantastic. So those are my choices. George Roy Hill, a great career. Still some films of his I haven't seen. The one I've heard a lot about uh, with Paul Newman that's supposed to be great is called Slap Shots. I think it's like a sports film from 77, which yeah, is a famously movie. a movie that uh, Gene Siskel gave a thumbs down. And then later on, years later, called it one of his favorite films. <laughs> like it's a movie he didn't like. And then mm -hmm. throughout the years, he warmed up to it and it became like a favorite film of his. So that's like a famous movie for him. And, and that, that's where I think I first heard about it. But I love Paul Newman. It's a sports film. It's George Roy Hill. So I think I'll like that. I'm excited to see it. Yeah, absolutely. Another one that I have probably on the shelf back here behind me. But yes, I, I'll, <laughs> I'll dust all these George Roy Hill films off and just have a weekend. I think what you need to do, that I, like th this would overwhelm me if I had like dozens and dozens of unopened blu-rays behind me and i just didn't know like i think i would just like like stack up the unopened blu-rays that you've never seen in alphabetical order and then starting on like the first week of january you just like once a week you just go in alphabetical and you watch one a week and just like force yourself to do that 
I think that's how you do it. How you get through the film. Uh, <laughs> Otherwise, you'll just stare at all these unopened movies for the until the end of time. True. True. <laughs> I, I hear this kind of intervention from you, Brian. I'll, I'll get to it. I'll, I'll put your plan into practice. Give, just give it a try. Just and just like you have like from Monday morning to Sunday night, any two hour block you have. Okay. <laughs> Deal. For you, I'll do it. And I have to do the same thing. Trust me. Yes. Okay. This has been so much fun, Dylan, talking about Slaughterhouse Five and the career of George Roy Hill today. As we reach the end here, I'd love for you to talk if you want to say anything more about your podcast, which you mentioned before, where our listeners can find you online and anything you'd like to promote, now would be the time. Absolutely. As previously mentioned, I, I co-host the Home Dance Film Festival. You can fa- find us on Twitter at Home Dance Pod. Okay. Um, if you like Sundance movies or just movies in general, we talk like it's a lot of fun uh, talking about that each week. Um, I also am a senior critic for Mm -hmm. geekvibesnation.com. You can find me writing reviews there regularly. I also host a video on our YouTube channel, uh, Geek Vibes Podcast, the YouTube channel. And that is where I talk about home media releases. So like Blu-rays and 4Ks and all of that. So if you want to hear more of my rambling about that, (laughs) that's great. And then finally on Twitter, you can follow follow me at Dylan Gonzalez 2 okay who's number who's one some <laughs> jerk who i need to convince twitter to give me that handle because it's been dead for a, oh. forever but i i that's on my to-do list so <laughs> yeah unfortunately yeah yeah my name is also very common and when i signed up for twitter in summer of 2010 brian Rowe was already taken so i went with mr brian Rowe, mr and I've just like, I've never really looked into <laughs> trying to change it. I've just, it's been 12 years. I'll just stick to that, I guess. But yeah, sometimes it's not just readily available or name on Twitter or some of these other places. You have to yeah. figure something, find an alternate <laughs> way to say it. If I knew how important Twitter would have been back when I joined, I probably would have done something different than just putting a two at the end. But <laughs> that's just my burden to bear. <laughs> well, I learned my lesson in uh, when I signed up for AOL in 95 and I went with uh Bry Guy 5555. <laughs> At least I didn't do that for Twitter in 2010. I would be regretting that today. So it worked out. <laughs> so yeah, thanks for being here, Dylan. Thanks to all of you for listening. You can find us online at filmat50.com or on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And check out my new YouTube channel, Brian Rowe Video, where I do lots of video essays on Oscars history and Academy Awards history. I talk about the careers of famous actors, directors, screenwriters, and some of my all-time favorite films. Check that out at uh, Brian Rowe Video on YouTube. Until next time, remember, 50 never looked this good. <laughs>